And for more analysis now, let's bring in Sky News host Laura Jays and political strategist and close friend of Scott Morrison's David Gazard. Welcome to you both. Great to have you both with me on this historic election eve weekend. Laura, the coalition is looking at a record loss of 22 seats. It's just extraordinary. What do you put this poor result down to? Is it, is it just the Prime Minister or are you looking at a range of factors from the fact that they didn't even have candidates in yeah. place uh, in New South Wales right on the eve of the election campaign? It's an extraordinary result, isn't it? And there's so many um, aspects to this. So let me quickly get through just a couple. I think what this shows is the campaign didn't matter. I think that Australians made up their mind about Scott Morrison a long time ago. For the last year, I've been following focus groups. I even sat in on them. And even at the height of lockdown, after lockdown, when things were going pretty well, what always came back was the bushfires. So that was still hurting Scott Morrison three years later. Um, there are a lot of aspects to this. Let's talk about the teal wave first. It's happened on the east coast around Sydney and Melbourne. There is a reason why these independent candidates are teal and they are women and they're smart women. They've had careers before. The independents were honing in on something that the Liberals have refused to acknowledge for quite some time and that is women voters. And I'm not talking about more funding for domestic violence shelters and um, some of those agendas that are really important. I'm just talking about they're, uh, they're having a level of invisibility. You know, they talk about they don't want quotas because everything's merit-based. Well, there's women in these seats, I believe, Shari, that are looking, at, you know, at the Liberals and saying, hang on, what do you mean merit-based? Women are actively being blocked in getting to the Liberal Party. Look at how New South Wales pre-selected their candidates. They waited to the very last minute. Yes, they had some women in there, but they weren't in winnable seats. Look who's lost their uh, seats. Is six women who have lost their seats. Now, that's the next generation. So the women issue, I don't think, can be understated and cannot be swept under the carpet. Women don't just vote for women. I get that. But I think there is a real impatience among Liberal not just progressive Liberals, but conservative. I mean, look at the seat of Wentworth. Yep. We're talking about bankers. We're talking about hedge fund managers. We're talking about, you know, multi-millionaires who, you know, you might call them the elites. Some, some people might call them the elites. They're no longer looking at the Liberal Party. And it is telling that the people Climate 200 chose uh, to run as the candidates were, were predominantly female. Mm. David Gazard, do you think this was a, a female vote that cost Scott Morrison uh, the election or, or do you think um, the support, the movement towards the Teals was more about climate change and, you know, it, it was just that they chose women as candidates because it's a, a, a friendlier face? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't really know, Shari, um, and I... I hate to, I'd hate to sort of take a stab in the dark on that. I think both issues were probably relevant. Mm. Um, the, the thing I'd add to, to, to what Laura has just said, though, is that, you know, winning a fourth term is always difficult. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's what the Liberal Party were, were seeking to do here in, in coalition with the National Party. So it's always a challenge to win a fourth term in, in, in any modern parliament. I mean, it's, it's tough to win two terms in a modern parliament mm. these days. So going for, for four terms, and um, it, it has, I, I haven't had a chance to look at all the, the, uh, the latest numbers today. I, I think Gilmore uh, is going to return to the Liberal fold with Andrew, yeah. Andrew Constance, and that, that, was a, that was a very bushfire-affected seat. So I, I don't quite know whether it's you're reading tight. a bit too much into... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, still it's tight. very They're tight, still I think. So it could, it, it, could, it, it could go either way. Um, the, the, the one thing I'd say more generally about... The, the teals is that um, they are they are women predominantly as you pointed out and they are a single issue party a collective this has been organized by by some Simon Holmes of let's let's not beat around the bush with mm. that labor will now govern in its own right so effectively the the the, the teals are uh, uh, you know, going to sit on the crossbench without any real power. Um, and I, I, I'm not quite sure whether the, the voters in those seats who, for whatever reason, you know, whether they be bankers or women or, you know, people wanting to make a change on the climate, uh, are going to be satisfied with just independents that are, are sitting out there and, and could be reduced to irrelevancy because Labor are 
have already said they're sticking with their, their, their climate policies that they've taken to the election. Mm. But and I'm so they may not... Yeah, no, go ahead. I, no, I, t I take your point that they, because they aren't going to have the balance of power, there's no minority government, their influence will be diluted. But on the other hand, we have seen a thorough rejection of both major parties. Yeah. The primary vote Absolutely. is so low for, for both the coalition and Labor. And this move towards, um, you know, independence or other parties is something we've already seen in Europe. So, so Laura, you know, maybe this is a new trend that will change yeah. politics permanently and uh, that, that, you know, it's been a threat to the Liberals this time, but next time perhaps they'll run against Labor MPs, they'll target right. Labor MPs and they could become a, a permanent force or feature of our political system and, and a force to be reckoned with in the future. I think they are. Uh, and you say Europe, Germany. Look at Germany. They've been dealing th with this for many years. It means that sometimes at elections as well, these minor parties get more extreme. That's not something you really want to see here in Australia, by the way. But it's not just the teal independents. Look at some of the orange independents in, in the country areas. I mean, Dai Li, she's a former Liberal. She has essentially beaten Christina Keneally at her own game in the seat of Fowler. So it's not just a till independence. There is a real uh, note of authenticity, if you like. Um, connection to community, I think, is really important. Um, and whilst, you know, m mainstream media like us can't cover everything, I mean, the Greens, what have they been doing? Extraordinary ground game because they've been nowhere in mainstream media. They've just been doing their thing, chipping away at seats in and around Brisbane. But I think you're right. This is not... Um, this is a repudiation of Morrison in many ways. This is certainly not an election that Anthony, Anthony Albanese has won. Labor's primary vote is barely at 32% and they've got a majority. I mean, that is extraordinary in and of itself. Look at Queensland. They have... Labor have five of 31 seats in Queensland. So, you know, there are stories all over the country. Queensland, very different from yes. WA. Um, different so, again to Tassie. Yeah, and look, already Liberals were saying last night at that function, you know, oh, this could be two terms or three three terms, rubbish. The election cycle, uh, as we know, has, has sped up so fast that you can lose after one term. So I think Anthony Albanese's danger here is that he still needs to prove himself to the electorate in many ways, who maybe held their nose and voted for Labor or voted for the independents knowing that they'd get an Albanese prime ministership. So he will be tempted, I think, to recognise the mandate of these independents and potentially the Greens. So the Greens get maybe four seats in the lower house, perhaps. Extraordinary. They've got 12 in, in the Senate. So either way, Labor is going to have to negotiate the Greens. Look, they wouldn't be stupid enough to do any kind of formal deals. Yeah. But this is going to be something to watch. And his critics within his party on the right and outside the party will be watching like a hawk, ready to slap him down as soon as he looks like he's moving to the left. Yeah. David, just on the teals, this is clearly um, an area that the government, that Scott Morrison, that the Liberal pollsters and researchers grossly underestimated. You know, at, at most, um, my understanding is that Liberal Party polling uh, thought that North Sydney might go to a teal, but thought that Josh Frydenberg would just hang on, Goldstein would mm -hmm. just hang on, Wentworth, Dave Sharma would be fine. Uh, and then, we, you know, it was just this absolute bloodbath with the teals last night. Why do you think they were underestimated? And do you think the strategy that the government took to deal with them was wrong? Because in my opinion, um, you, you know, and this was a criticism I made of Josh Frydenberg, that he helped elevate Monique Ryan by agreeing to a debate with her. He should never have been debating her. He's the treasurer. He was the treasurer and, and she's a nobody. So, you know, the government and the Liberal Party were giving these deals so much attention and raising their profile and their credibility in the process. Well, if you've lost, you, you, you were wrong. Um, but you can only go on the, the best available information. I, I, I think, you know, this reminds me a lot of the, the, the 2004 election where Labor were in front we're under Mark Latham all the way into the, the, the last week, into Wednesday, Thursday of the last week. But on polling day, um, the undecided voters crystallised probably around the, the Latham, the famous Latham handshake and went back to the government. I think, you know, everything you've said is right about bigger swings, more volatility, the swings being more urgent and broader. Um, and in this case, um, voters got into the polling booth on, on Saturday and said, well, we, we, we want to send a message to the government for whatever reason. There were still potent reasons to run the, uh, 
the, the campaign that they did, but in the end, uh, they were proven wrong by, by events on, on Saturday. So, mm. you know, could you have seen that coming? Um, was it in the polls? Um, I think there was probably a bit of that, but, but uh, you know, there was this huge undecided cohort that, that for whatever reason, got in the booth and just went, no, um, whether they were influenced by, you know, the huge presence at, at polling stations by the Teals, I, I, I don't know. But whatever it was on the decisive day, um, they, they broke heavily to the Teals. Yeah, but pre-polls and one... postals are also breaking the same way. So, you know, it wasn't just a last-minute thing on Election Day. I think we saw a trend over the postals and And, and there's no question anyone who lives in any of the uh, seats mm. where the Teals were contesting can, can attest to the fact that there was a much bigger spend oh, by, by the millions. Teals than by the Liberal millions candidates. Millions upon millions. Uh, you, couldn't, you know, you couldn't get through a street without seeing mm. various postals. Yeah, there's no doubt. And there, there was, was no... Liberal there was no, um, you know, equivalent Liberal spend. The, the, the one thing I think has to be stated here, though, is this has been an inner-city phenomenon. The, yes. the, the, the Liberal Party and the National Party's vote more generally is held up across regional Australia, and it, it goes to show where both major parties are, are suffering because they're in a pincher movement from the left and the right. Yeah. And, and this will be one of the things that, that Anthony Albanese has to grapple with over the, over the next while. The, 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 the Climate 200 candidates will be demanding more action on their single issue. Mm. Um, if they don't get what they want, they, they can turn on the inner, the inner city seats of, of Graindler and Sydney and some of those strongholds that Labor's had. And they've yeah. shown how well-funded and, and, and well... Well, well able sure, to, David, to run I campaigns in those Liberals, seats. This is the Liberals' problem right now. I right mean, now, but in three years' time. It is, well, sure, it is right yeah. now. But, but, sure, but, but, but we're already, but we're, already we're in now. this existential crisis. I mean, you have Alex Antique going, oh, the progressive uh, frolic is he's proven not to be correct. Well, show me a seat that the Liberals or Nationals would have won if they didn't go climate net zero or if they went further to the right. I mean, the, the fact is, even if you look at some of these national seats, they haven't lost to One Nation and UAP all that much on the right flank. Again, they've lost in some of these seats, Hunter, Patterson. They're, they're not, not, not losing these seats, but they're losing... Skin. Well, they didn't win Hunter, of course, yeah. but that they did lose some of their vote to the left. Yeah, and, th and this is obviously going to be a debate... Um, David, that's oh, going to be that's, fascinating. I mean, it already started today, whether the Liberal Party should be moving more to the right or, or, or more to the left. Um, but, but, you know, it's yeah. hard to have that argument. The answer when isn't they've either. they've just wiped out... Absolutely, it yeah. should be a centred party. But it's hard to have that argument when all of the moderates have just been wiped out and you're about <laughs> to have Peter Dutton as the leader. But, but, David, I actually wanted to ask you something as well. You know, there's been... A, you're obviously very close friends with uh, Scott Morrison... There's been a lot of speculation about what he does now. I'm hearing that he might actually stay in the parliament just as an MP to offer stability and support to the Liberal Party in this tumultuous time. And he might stay there for uh, the rest of this year or for, for 12 months or so. He may well do that. Um, it, it does remind me of, of uh, Peter Costello, who... Um when the coalition lost in 2007, stayed on for a year or so. I think there's always that view among, amongst MPs that are close to their communities that, you know, they've just been rewarded by re-election by, by their, their voters. And the last thing they really want to do is to say, well, sorry, I didn't get the job I wanted, so I'm, I'm out of here. So mm. there's sort of a, a, a show of faith with the community, if you will, to stick around and still represent them through what is a tumultuous time for the Liberal Party more generally. So but, but it also wouldn't a duty surprise me if his, he stays around for a while. But also a duty to his, yeah. his colleagues, perhaps, that he, he wants to provide that stability and that guidance as they try and take on Albanese from opposition? Yeah, po possibly. Um, the, the, sometimes it, 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 it's, you know... It, if you've got ambitions um, and you're sitting on the back bench, it can be a destabilising effect, of course, as we've seen in, with with some other leaders. But I, I, I don't detect that in in, in Scott Morrison at Can't all. Can't imagine I think him white handing. He, oh no, never. He, he, they look, never he, do. He, he, <laughs> None of them. He, he, this will be this will be a, a measure of faith that he yeah. wants to show um, to to the people that supported him in Cook.
Well, let's have a look at, at Scott Morrison today because last night um, he gave a very impressive speech, a very impressive performance, and, and today he showed a bit of the emotion that he must surely be going through after losing the top job. I'm very pleased that the last thing I say as PM is here. And even if the fig tree does not blossom, There is no fruit on the vines if the yield of the olive oil fails and if the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph for the Lord. Showing some rare emotion and tearing up there. Yeah, you don't really see Scott Morrison speaking from notes or um, pausing or really lost for words, and he was saying, you can completely understand that. Um, and to see that emotion, I mean, it just reminds you what he put into the role, I think, and how much he believed in it, um, and that, you know, he was certainly not lazy, uh, he was energetic, he believed in in his party, and he believes in Australia. So that is something you can't take away from him. And to see that today, um, it's not pity that you feel, but you do feel... Um, you do feel some affection from a Prime Minister in that position. Elections uh, aren't always fair. I mean, they are in the sense that they're, they're legal, <laughs> you know course, what I mean? Yep. Uh, we're not going down we're the Trump path the here or anything yeah. like that. But, you know, uh, sometimes they would feel um, a bit unfair and I think after the three years he's been through, I think um, he probably feels like he doesn't deserve this kind of route. Yeah. Mm. David, you were with... The Prime Minister, you were with Scott Morrison last night at Curibilly House as you watched the results come through. You know, was there a moment when you all, um, you know, all of the mates that were there together realised that you weren't going to make it into government? And, and, you know, what was their reaction like at that time? There, there's always that moment where it dawns on you that you, you, you're just not going to... You're not going to get there. At, at, at that point... Um, he, uh, he he called his close his closest staff together and they started working on the concession speech. Um, but I, I look, I mean, the, the last term has been the most extraordinary period of time because we've gone through a, a global pandemic. So I, I've been lucky enough to work for uh, Prime Minister John Howard and Treasurer Peter Costello. It is tough running a competent government in the best of times, <laughs> and and those two did an amazing job. I mean, but. That takes a huge amount of effort. Layer over the top of it a, a global pandemic that has tested federation and the boundaries of federation. Mm. And Australia's emerged with a really sound economy. We've, we, we've had our problems with, with, with vaccines and rat tests and all the rest of it. But our death rates are, 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 are you know, second to none. We, we've got high vaccination rates. We've emerged from this thing in much better shape than, than uh, many other comparable countries. So, I mean, the, the, the amount of work that just went into the pandemic management on top of the normal day job of, of running a competent government and looking after the budget and maintaining security arrangements and so on and so forth, you know, has been extraordinary. I, I think, you know, and I, I went through it in a minor way when, when I was a candidate. You, you tend to be so focused on the day that you, you just, you're not thinking about tomorrow. You know, you're not thinking about the Sunday after the election and there's this dawning realisation that you've moved into a completely different phase of your life after giving so much personal energy, so much time, so much effort. And there's, I, I don't think anyone would ever say that, that Scott Morrison is not, you know, one of the most assiduous, hardworking guys yeah. around, whether he's running the budget or, you know, um, stopping boats or whatever, yeah. or being Prime Minister. So, you know, the, the amount of effort, the, the, the exhaustion, I think, that, it, that is on his shoulders at the moment has been tremendous. So he has given it all. But there is that really emotional period where you, you're with friends or you're in church because he's a man of deep faith where, you know, you've thought you, you, you're going to go into a new term and that's, that's taken away. And that's a, that's, a, that's a crushing time for any leader. Yeah, yeah. And I think he's faced a lot of media hostility as well. There's no question about that through mm. his entire time as Prime Minister. And um, his legacy will only improve within time, just like John Howard's has. Laura Jays, David Gazard, thank you both very much. Thanks,